to the Messy Antics Podcast, a podcast about all things Messianic Judaism. Each episode, we will be sharing our opinions as we tackle some of the biggest issues in Messianic Judaism. Now, here's your hosts, Rabbis Eric, David, Jonathan, and Toby. Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of the Messy Antics Podcast as we dive into uh, another episode addressing some uh, questions and answers that have come into us. Uh, and I think this is going to be a series that we try to run for a little while because it's always fun. You know, it's, it's great for us to talk about and espouse uh, what we think you would like to know and, and what could be good for you. But it's also um, uh, more enjoyable for us as teachers by nature to uh, to answer questions you actually have right. rather than, than just, just mansplaining trying. to everybody. Exactly. exactly. So uh, this question came in from Joe, um, and uh, it has to do with Shavuot, which comes up the 11th and 12th. Uh, if you're uh, following a more traditional approach outside of Israel and the diaspora, it'd be 11th, 12th through the 13th. Um, in Israel, the 11th and 12th specific. Uh, but uh, the question is, Shavuot is a major holiday uh, or a major holy day in Judaism. How do your communities celebrate? Have you stayed up all night studying Torah? Uh, and so I thought we would just have a conversation about Shavuot in general uh, and uh, and discuss these questions specific as well. So I guess first off, let's talk about how our congregations typically celebrate uh, Shavuot. And I, actually, I'll tell you what, let's backtrack that a little bit. Uh, We'll toss it to Rabbi Eric. Do you want to set up a foundation for our listeners of what Shavuot is in general in in a brief synopsis? Yeah, Shavuot is one of the feasts that were commanded in Leviticus 23. It takes place 50 days after the day of the first fruits waving that takes place during uh, Passover, which is the first harvest of the barley. So there's this counting of days to the 50th day, and on the 50th day we celebrate Shavuot, or the Feast of Weeks, uh, also known as Pentecost by people in Christianity. Um, This is a time where in traditional Judaism the giving of the Torah is celebrated, as well as uh, people eat products made with uh, dairy and uh, honey, honey, uh, because of the land of milk and honey. And so there's that aspect of the giving of the Torah. It all ha- also happens to be when the outpouring of the Ruach uh, takes place on Shavuot. Now, I want to make it clear this is not the first time that the Ruach or the Spirit of God is poured out upon people. We see that through the entire scripture. And if you're uh, looking for an interesting read on that, uh, Rabbi David wrote a, a great book that talks about the uh, giving and filling, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit starting in Genesis rather than starting in the book of Acts. Uh, but that's what's celebrated at this time. When we read in the book of Acts about thousands of people gathering at the temple to celebrate Shavuot, uh, it's a holiday that had been celebrated Uh, since the giving of the Torah, and it was not a new holiday called Pentecost that was started by the church in order to celebrate this outpouring. So uh, that's what we're celebrating during this time, both the giving of the Torah and the outpouring of the Ruach, uh, and both experiences, uh, if you read uh, the traditional historical uh, writings, uh, mirror each other. There's, uh, as a matter of fact, the rabbis teach that when... The Torah was given at Sinai when God spoke uh, from the mountain that all the people heard his voice in their own languages in the same way Mm -hmm. that all those gathered around at the temple heard in their own language, that there was fire that lit upon just like there was fire that lit upon. These are mirror image events that take place. Uh, So that's what we're celebrating is both the giving of the Torah and the outpouring of the Ruach. Uh, so so that's what Shavuot is. And, and I'm going to let Rabbi David name the book that he wrote so that uh, if you want to check it out, you can get it. Wait, and I'm, I'll throw it in the show link. Sh- also, show notes also. Uh, but the book's called Spirit and Truth, Rediscovering the Holy Spirit from Creation Through Today. It's available on Amazon in print or uh, in paperback or Kindle edition. Uh, but back to Shavuot specifically, one of the things that I think is really interesting about Shavuot is you know, the, the Jewish tradition – and, and people love to say, well, that's just Jewish tradition, right? Well, the Jewish tradition is that uh, Shavuot is the day in which the giving of 
the particularly the Aseret Hadith wrote the the ten words or uh, what are often called the ten commandments were given in Exodus twenty. Uh, but but specifically, we know Moses stayed on the mountain, and so Judy would say that was the beginning of the giving of the Torah to Israel, and so we celebrate the giving of the Torah on Shavuot. And uh, and a lot of people go, well, that's just tradition. Da, da, da. But I actually think personally, and you know, pipe in if you want. I think personally, the fact that the events of Acts two occurred on Shavuot and mirrored the events of Exodus nineteen and twenty, I think is actually God. Um, um, kind of solidifying that it's more than just tradition. These two things are direct, directly linked to this specific day for a specific reason. Uh, and, and and also to that end, uh, Rabbi Eric mentioned first fruits. Um, there's a lot of confusion. Like I, I've heard, and, and I know you have too, uh, you guys have too, I've heard people over the years say, you know, there's the, the seven holy days of Leviticus 23, but the reality is there's actually only six technically listed. The seventh one, the, the the one people call the seventh one, is the the feast of first fruits, which, generally speaking, isn't a feast unto itself. It's not like Pesach that occurs on a specific day, Shavuot that occurs on a specific day, what have you. But rather, that first fruits is that season between Pesach and Shavuot. Right. But even more specific and adding more confusion to the discussion is Judaism often looks at Shavuot as the day of first fruits because Numbers twenty eight links it to being first fruits. <laughs> Um, so uh, uh, it, it's just wanted to point that out that there is like this extra pseudo thing called first fruits, um, but it's it's really more specifically that season of the Omer, uh, and and if we had to be more direct, Shavuot would be that actual yeah. day as well. And, and one of the things that we have to remember also is that in Judaism we celebrate days and seasons, yeah. and so there's actually a season that begins with Pesach and runs through Shavuot, and there's a season that begins with Rosh Hashanah, Rosh Hashanah and runs through Sukkot. It's not just a holy day, but this a holy season yeah. that encompasses its two halves of the circle, so to speak, mm-hmm. of time, the precursor and the follow-up, and in order to understand it, you have to keep it in that format. Uh, Joe specifically said that a reference that Shavuot is a major holy day in Judaism, and for for me, I think Shavuot is one of the most important. Like I look at the the Moedim in, in Leviticus twenty three, and if you guys can correct me if you look at it differently, I look at it in in kind of three tiers. Uh, so you have the weekly Shabbat, which is the most holy of them all because it comes around every single week, fifty two weeks a year, every single year of your life, right? Uh, so the Shabbat, Shabbat is the most holy, and it's directly linked prophetically to the the Olam Haba, the the world to come, uh, to heaven, however you want to look at that. Uh, and then the second tier, which I think out of the, the, the major holy days is the most important, the second tier uh, out of the, the rest of them would be the Shalosh Regalim, of Pesach, Shavuot, and Sukkot. Uh, these were feasts that we were commanded to travel to the temple in Jerusalem to observe and celebrate, to uh, rejoice before the Lord, and so on. And then the third tier is what Judaism today calls the uh, High Holy Days, which are Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. Um, and uh, they're, they're vitally important. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying they don't have, have tremendous value, but they, we weren't required in the same sense to show up at the temple every year. And part of the reason it's considered the High Holy Days in Judaism today is because we don't have a temple standing, so we can't really live out the Shalos Regalim in the same way, so we've kind of migrated to those as the High Holy Days. Um, but in that, I think Shavuot's one of the most important uh, things, and one of the things that this question brought up was, have you stayed up all night studying Torah, which is a tradition of Shavuot, because uh, there's the, the tradition linking the giving of the Torah to Shavuot, there's a tradition of Tukun Shavuot, and stay up all night discussing and reading through Torah and, and reading through uh, the Book of Ruth and a few other things like that. Um, so uh, what's your experiences with something like a Tukun Shavuot? Uh, in your your congregations, you know, growing up, uh, and how you do things now, what what's your experience with Tikkun Lashon Did y'all ever do that growing up? Oh, we did. We had the all night Torah study that took place at the synagogue that we were part of. We uh, we have it at our synagogue now, and and it's interesting to me that that because we're a, a Judaism that accepts the New Testament. How uh, dare you? No. There is this. Um, we we have both things. In, in other words, there there in traditional Judaism, the Torah is the primary at this point. In Christianity, they celebrate Pentecost, but they don't connect it with the giving of the Torah. 
where the scripture says that they worship the, those who worship God must worship him in spirit and in truth and I think that that sentence implies this connection of Shavuot of this experience of getting the Torah getting the word of God having God speak truth into our lives but also understanding as Romans says that without the Ruach without the spirit of God it's impossible to follow the Torah that, that it requires both of those things, that the carnal mind is contrary to the word of God and cannot keep it. So I think that Messianic Judaism, because we, uh, we express our celebration of Shavuot with both the understanding of the Torah and the importance of Torah and the outpouring of the Ruach and the importance of the influence of the Ruach into our life, that we actually have, I believe, what God intended for this holy day. And so, yeah, we stay up all night uh, reading, but we also have a service that is a worship service, that's a praise service. Mm-hmm. So it's not just stay up all night reading, and it's not just have a charismatic expression of a remembrance of the infilling of the <coughs> Holy Spirit, but it's a combination of both of those things right. involved. So it's not one or the other, but uh, it's not either or, it's and both. Right. Yeah, we've been doing the all night Torah study at Bradam um, for we started last year. We may have done it. I, we haven't done it until then. T- maybe y'all did it before I got here. But, we did, but um, then COVID came up. Um, oh, there he goes blaming COVID. So, um, anyway, so I so but I sort of COVID came. The word of God. I sort stopped. of no. I, I sort of restarted it uh, last year because I was like, hey, we should really do this. This would be fun, and everyone was like, yeah, that'd be a good idea. Let's do it. And so last year, last Shavuot, a year ago was our first time uh doing it for shavuot we also do it during simcha torah um so we've done it twice at the synagogue the all night studying yeah. thing and i i really enjoy it so i i know there are there is a specific reading plan mm-hmm. and within traditional judaism uh for doing that we have not followed that yet uh tip what we've done so far is we've just picked okay which book of the torah do we want to read through and discuss all night long and so we don't even make it all the way through the torah mm-hmm. um i think last shavuot we did genesis and we we like just scratch the surface on barely the managed to actually read through all of genesis while talking about it um mostly just because there's so much narrative yeah. within Gen- genesis a lot to talk about so this year we're doing exodus also a lot of narrative so we'll see how that goes uh, this year but we're, we're focusing primarily on just a book at a time mm-hmm. and it, it gives people the experience of being able to really um Spin. I mean, because most people do not get the chance to just spend, you know, six hours yeah. to just reading and discussing one of the books of the Bible. Yeah. And so this will be the chance to do that. So wish I'd thought about it sooner, but I just had an idea that would have been cool for Tikkun Lel Shavuot. It's too late to put it to, to put it into works now at CMC, but I think it'd be cool to do a Tikkun Lel Shavuot focused on the Aserat Hadibrot, but in particular, you know, for instance, uh, one of the commands is to honor your father and mother, right? which clearly has nothing to do with little kids because they have no clue of the concept of honor. Yeah, yeah. Like, it's not the, the you know, legalistic, yeah, listen to what your parents tell you, or you're getting a smack kind of a thing. Um, it really has to do with how you treat your parents when you're older, right. how you care for them, and so on. And I think it'd be really interesting to do an all-night Tikkun Lashavuot focused on the kind of conspiracy theory red string of the, the Aserat Hadi Brot with all of the ways that that's explained further throughout the rest of the Torah. Um, uh, and such like, you know, honor your father and mother, you know, provide for them when they're older and can't take care of themselves, et cetera. Right. Uh, I think it'd be really cool to kind of track through that and have that conversation. Uh, Rabbi Toby, the congregations that you were at previously, have you guys done uh, anything for Tukun Lel Shabbat? Uh, usually it's just uh, like a Shabbat service. I mean, um, I've been at three congregations, uh, and the first two it was just like a service with just worship music. Yeah. Usually, Usually there's more music than usual. Just to focus on worship and stuff, and and the rabbi gives a message, and there's some liturgy, and uh, but basically a lot of what we do during Shabbat services. Um, I'm trying to remember what last year at CMC was my first time. I think we were just up late reading scripture. Some people stayed right. We had, uh, well, last year we connected with UMJC's Tikkun Lel Shavuot online and had it playing in the sanctuary. Yeah, yeah. So that's I remember having the service, and then I remember them yeah. doing the the union 
event on the on the stream. I mean, God doesn't say very much about it, and that's God's prerogative. Uh, just like He doesn't say very much about uh, Yom Teruah, which is known as Rosh Hashanah. I, I, he he just doesn't say very much, um, and I think that that's what makes uh, Shavuot and you know by proxy uh, Yom Teruah, but um, Shavuot particularly because we're in that season. I think what makes um, those holy days interesting is the it, it, it and differs them from say Yom Kippur, um, Sukkot, uh, Passover is that. Those particular ones, Yom Kippur, Passover, Sukkot, um, come with particular instructions and external actions that God prescribes. Shavuot is just show up and bring an offering. Um, so I do think it, I do think the, the the New Testament counterpart uh, to what happened in the the Torah uh, versus um, you know what what happened in Acts happening on Shavuot is is very very. Uh, you can learn a great deal about uh, Shavuot by by looking at what happened in Acts, which had nothing to do with with uh, speaking in tongues. Um, honestly, as far as um, that, that, that that the gift of speaking in tongues, I don't think has a lot. I don't think that's what Shavuot has to do with um, as much as it has to do with the Holy Spirit and and furthering the gospel and those kinds of things. But um, as far as how to celebrate it, it it, it, it really is. I, I think that you can uh, be informed by some very beautiful traditions, like reading from Scripture and just um, expounding on Scripture and uh, expositing Scripture and all those things and having discussions and focusing on the Word of God and all those things. Um, but yeah, I, I always thought, I think the ones that God doesn't say very much about are the ones that honestly are, are the most interesting. I mean, my favorite feast is uh, Sukkot. But um, and and my wife says Passover, so w- we love those. And I think I like the I think I like Sukkot, and and I enjoy Passover. It's probably my second favorite. But the reason why I think I like those is because I like uh, knowing what I'm supposed to do, and God gives particular expectations for those for those feasts. Shavuot is very interesting because there just isn't a whole lot of um, external instruction things to walk out. And uh, but but yeah, in in my experience, it's just it was just like any other service. I mean, I really enjoyed ours because uh, though it was a lot more intentional. It wasn't just play some music and we're going to give a message. Right. So I like that idea. Um, but yeah, that, so that, and, that, and that I've only done that for a year. Or so most there, of the- there is one aspect of Shavuot that we don't often talk about, but I think is something the Scripture does command and tell us. And uh, and in light of. Uh, the understanding of Passover and this this uniqueness of of seasons where Passover and Shavuot are connected. On Shavuot, we're commanded to eat leavened bread. Uh, we're supposed to make have two loaves, and those two loaves are waved over the people. And whether those two loaves are representative of Jews and Gentiles, or it's representative of the first five and the second five commandments and the uh, the Ten Commandments, or however we look at that. Uh, there's a lot of focus on Passover of the matzah being yeast-free and yeast being a symbol of sin. And if yeast is sin and not just a symbol of sin or a symbol of some type of sin, uh, then uh, why are we commanded then to eat bread made with yeast on the day that we celebrate the giving of the Torah and the giving of the Ruach? And the understanding is that if you start with fresh yeast at Shavuot, by the time you get to Passover, that yeast that is used over and over and over to make bread, because you take the yeast, uh, which is a, a, a pinch of starter, it's part of starter, and yeah. you add that to yeah, your bread. I would bread. say take leavening. Yeah, leavening, it's not, it's like, yeah. It's not like, yeah. Right, and you add it to your bread each for the whole year. By the time you get to the end of a year, it is no longer pure. It's no longer what it was. And, and Israel went into Egypt understanding who they were, understanding what covenants were with God, understanding all of those things. But it got diluted in Egypt to where when they came out of Egypt, they had to be re-given God's commands. There's this re-giving of uh, the Torah because Torah commands, many of them are already existent. 
We know what tithing is. We know what not to murder. We know what offerings were. We know what Shabbat was. We know, uh, you know, uh, marriage is existent. We know circumcision. All that exists before they go into Egypt. But because they be, go to Egypt and they're a part of culture in Egypt, just like yeast becomes less and less and less and less uh, as time goes on, you have to renew that yeast. And, and on Shavuot, when the Torah is given to Israel at Mount Sinai, at this moment, it is a renewing of what God has given. Right. And then when we see in Acts, we see this same thing where in the temple, the priesthood had become political. There was all this yeast, this bad yeast that was going on in the temple. And then we have this re-giving, this this new infilling of the Ruach that happens on the same day again. And we see this almost prophetic fulfillment of a renewing of fresh yeast, fresh power, fresh Ruach right. that's given on the same time. So it's not disconnected. It's not that God now gave us the infilling of the Spirit and that replaced the Torah. But it's on the same day that we're celebrating the giving of the Torah, there's this refreshing of the yeast, right. of the chemical reaction, yeah. of the the internal response to yeah. stimulus that brings this about. And I think that's one of the most powerful, symbolic, and meaningful parts of Shavuot. But it's overlooked because we don't really focus on the fact that in Passover we're commanded not to eat any yeast, to get all rid of all the old yeast. Right. But on Shavuot, we're commanded to have new yeast right. <clears throat> and start with new loaves of bread yeah. and start over. It's not a replacement. It's a renewing of. Right. Well, and, you know, it goes hand in hand with several of Yeshua's parables about you know, not using a, a new patch on an old wineskin, not, um, you know, not mixing the old with the new. Um, you know, oh, I think he, t- he even says, you know, beware, the, you know, beware the leaven of the Pharisees. You know, get rid of the old leaven. You know, because and that's the battle he faces with so many of these different sects. Is so many of them were so stuck in the past and preserving who they were as God's people. You know, because again, and you have to feel bad for them. I mean, like they they come out of Babylon, they're like, okay, we're going to adhere to the commandments this way. We're going to erect these fences that are going to protect us from ever being put back into diaspora. Again, ever going against what God has given us to do. Um, And they're so defensive that they can't embrace what God is doing. The fulfillment, you know, in the Greek, the telos, the end of, not, not end is like closing a book, but like the goal of everything that God has worked for in his people through the Torah, through the prophets up to this point. Here it is. It has arrived, and they can't see it, and they can't embrace it because they have been filled with old leaven. And now some of them are willing to embrace the new. You know, Nicodemus is, is one of them. You have jo- uh, uh, Joseph of Arimathea. So you have – it's not – when he says, you know, beware the leaven of the Pharisees, it's not all of them. It's just, you know, the ones that are leading and uh, – supposed to be leading the people in a right way. Uh, and you do see this, yeah, like this and refilling. That, yeah, the, remember that the leaven that they were getting rid of at Passover was good leaven. Right. It's not that the le- that leaven in and of itself is evil or bad or sinful. Right. It's just that interacting with all of the forces over the year dilutes its value and its quality, and we have to renew uh, in this. And and so. It, it isn't getting rid of bread or leaven. It's getting rid of the old so that we can have new and start again. And and we have to be willing sometimes to let go of the old right. in order for God to, you, right. to do the new thing. Yeah. And Judaism faces that with Peter. Um, particularly, you know, this idea of Gentiles coming into the movement. You know, there's, there's this. It's a that's a new understanding for them. They're like, well, I mean, and again, the prophets talk about that. But in their time and space where they were facing the battles they faced with Rome and the oppression of Rome, that was a new concept. You know, and so they do. So in a way, they do have to embrace something quote unquote yeah. new, even though it wasn't really quote unquote new. So there were a couple of things we did at our congregation in Georgia that uh, I was the associate rabbi at that I've talked for years about wanting to implement at CMC and somehow forget until we get up to Shavuot and then it's too late to put it into effect. But one of the things we did, we, 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 would, have, we would have our service 
on Arab Shavuot every year. And then we would also have another service on the morning of Shavuot at like, I want to say it was like 8, 30, 9 o'clock, something like that. And so we would have our, our Arab Shavuot service. And then after our Arab Shavuot service, we would have a Tikkun El Shavuot every, uh, every year after uh, throughout the night. And basically what we would do is we would encourage people to come for service, to plan on staying, bring sleeping bags or air mattresses and pillows or whatever if you want to you know, find yourself sleeping at some point. In the sanctuary after service, we would turn the main lights down. We would have lights on on the stage. We had a reading table set up with a chair there. We had a um, schedule of shifts that people would read, and we mm-hmm. would have segments of the entire Torah scheduled out. And you would have people that would sign up to read a certain segment of scripture at a certain time uh, for you know, a half hour, 45 minutes, whatever it was. And we had a microphone set up and the, uh, the, uh, the light there, the Bible out. And whoever was signed up at their time, they would come up and they would spend the next half hour, 45 minutes, whatever it was, reading the passage of scripture they were responsible to read. And you would have people sitting in the sanctuary listening. Um, at, at some point, people would start spreading out and, and laying out their sleeping bags and sleep and have kind of the word read over them while they were sleeping. In other parts of the building, we would have um, in some of the back classrooms, we would have like movies playing. So we'd have like a kid's movie playing for the kids to entertain them. Or we would have a um, like. I think they did One Night with the Queen or something like that or whatever oh, it's fun. called the Esther movie yeah, yeah, yeah. Name One of Night it. with the King I something think. like that yeah. um, they they had that playing in one room and then in our fellowship hall we would have like different Bible studies going on so we'd have different people that would volunteer to lead a different Bible study for two hours or whatever and so there were different things happening around the building all night long the primary focus was the reading of the word throughout the night and right. everybody would volunteer to participate in that but the other thing we did was we would have everybody in the congregation would bring loaves of store-bought bread. And we were very intentional. It had to be store-bought, and it had to still be sealed. Mm -hmm. But we would bring loaves of store-bought bread, and and everybody would bring um, two loaves, preferably two loaves a person, but at least two loaves a a family, uh, bring them in. And we had a point in our service on the morning of Shavuot where we would do a wave offering, symbolic, you know, but it was a symbolic wave offering of the bread. And then all of that bread uh, that was brought in we would then take after our service and drive it to the local food shelter and donate it to the food shelter. Right. Uh, and so we usually would bring 80 to 100 loaves of brand new bread to wow. the, the food shelter every Shavuot as a blessing to them. Uh, and I've always thought, man, that's a really great thing to do. Um, and I keep forgetting to, to install it. But at CMC, we've done a few different things. Our Shavuot service every year is, is always a little different. And especially when it falls during an uh, ordinary weekday, um, we usually will do Arab, Shabbat sir, uh, Arab Shavuot service so that more people can participate because we've learned over the years if you do stuff during the day, uh, during the week, you have a, a lower attendance, but we want people to be able to participate. So every year it's a little different. One year we had a service that was almost entirely focused on prayer, prayer for healing. Um, we had one year, uh, a couple of years that we did like an intentional uh, night of worship for Shavuot. Um, the last couple of years, it's been like a hybrid with extra worship, but also a little bit of liturgy, uh, like intentional liturgy, a message. Last year, as Rabbi Tovi talked about, uh, we did uh, we joined in with uh, the greater UMJC for the UMJC's Tukun Lel Shavuot, in which they had a theme for the night, and they had different speakers on the hour, every hour, that would teach a different aspect of that theme. Um, and then, uh, and so we had that playing in the sanctuary. Those that wanted to stay, stayed. I actually taught at like 12 or 1 a.m. I forget what it was. Um, and so we had it up on air. I vanished in the office when it was time for me to go get set up. I did my teaching. When I came back out, we were watching as the night went on. Little by little, people would trickle out. But uh, when I came back out from teaching my segment of it, uh, I come out and the entire place is empty. So I shut everything down, turned the lights off, and went home and slept. Um, but uh, the And then this year, we're going to be encouraging people to participate in the UMJC's to Kulnel Shavuot, and we may put it up on screens, and I'll stick around for as long as people are willing to. Um, but the the I think the beauty of Shavuot, and I think the most important factor for us as, as Messianic believers, is the reality that in Exodus 19 and 20, the word of God was relayed to the people, right? So... And after Exodus 20, Israel gets scared, or at the end of Exodus 20, Israel gets scared and says, Moses, we can't take it anymore. His voice is too much. We're going to die. You go get the rest and bring it back to us. But I think the key to Exodus 19 and 20 is God's revelation to his people. 
He was speaking specifically to the people of Israel uh, who were then to carry his words to the nation. Um, And then we know that Jeremiah 31 promises that a time would come in which God would circumcise the heart of his people, which is the accusation throughout the Torah and throughout the prophets is that we are people of uncircumcised hearts. Um, And so when we look at Jeremiah 31, the Lord says, I'm going to circumcise your heart. I'm going to place the covenant upon the flesh of your heart. Uh, and then in Exodus, uh, I'm sorry, in Acts 2, we see the fulfillment of that reality, not the full fulfillment. There's still more to come, right? One of the things Rabbi Eric always points out is Jeremiah 31 specifically says that when he gives us that new covenant, it's etched upon the flesh of our heart. Man will not have to teach man again uh, the ways of the Lord. But clearly, we're still having to teach people the ways of the Lord. So we haven't seen the full fulfillment of it, but we have seen the initiation of that in in Acts 2 with the, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the corporate experience. Previously, it was always on individuals for specific purpose. Now it's on the corporate experience of the body of Messiah. And But what we see in, in Acts 2 is it wasn't something new. God was renewing or reviving something that had already been Right, and that's existent, what I'm saying had already about been this, commanded. this yeast. And yeah, the, yeah, yeah. Is this, it's and, not something that's new and replacing, but it's something that's renewing. Yeah. And so in, in Acts 2, we see that the beginnings of the fulfillment of that Jeremiah 31 covenant, uh, new covenant, in which the words of the, 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 the scripture are etched upon the flesh of our heart. Because the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, inspired the authorship of the Bible. Now the inspiration of the authorship of the Bible resides within us and is leading our actions not by how we read words on a page in front of our face, but rather how those words are alive within us and directing our steps. And so I think the most important, I think Shavuot is one of the most important uh, modim to observe within Messianic Judaism. Not that we shouldn't do the others, we should also do the others. But I think it's one of the most important to focus on within Messianic Judaism because of the fact that it is a, a revival of something that has happened. And it's a, more importantly, the revival of the revelation of God to his people, not the revelation of God to his people through an individual. But God himself revealing himself to his people. Um, and that's the beauty, I think, of Shavuot is we get that that kind of encompassing reality. Right. And one of the things that we did one year, uh, because the calendar played out in a unique way a few years ago, where both the Pharisaic counting and the Sadducean counting and the Christian calendar all aligned up so that Shavuot fell on the same day. We had a unified Shavuot service in which we joined together with uh, one of the local churches, Freedom Church, as well as others. And we had about 500 people that came to our synagogue from more than 16 different congregations to celebrate uh, this unity Shavuot, unified Shavuot service. Because all of that, it was a unique time when the Pharisaic counting, which starts at the day after the uh, the high Sabbath of Passover, the Sadducean counting, which starts on the Sunday of Passover, and the church counting, which uh, changes depending on the on Easter on the Easter. So all of those three, for once, fell on the same day. So we got together with some pastors and said, "Look, why don't we have a unit? Unif- this this doesn't happen all the time, where all of us are celebrating on the same day." So we had a uh, a beautiful, worshipful uh, service where we had about 500 people gathered together to worship in our synagogue uh, on this day. So that was one way we celebrated. So because the the topic was how do we do this, I didn't want to leave that one out because it was something that, and, and should those calendars align again, I'd love to do another one of those uh, services because it was such a powerful time of sharing and we had uh, a worship team that was not just our synagogue, but combined with other people from other uh, congregations and had this just powerful, powerful service uh, that took place. Anybody have anything else they want to add? Yeah, I'm trying to trying to just off in my head thinking like, well, I wonder when the next time will be those all align because it's, it's a few years still. Yeah, because it's, so, uh, you it, know, it's it's. Because you've got three different calendars, you know, going on. You've yeah, got yeah. the Western Christian calendar, the Gregorian. You've got yeah. the Hebrew calendar, and then the Julian for the uh, the Orthodox yeah. Christians. And it's kind of like uh, well, and the thing that was so important <laughs> about that particular year, um, and, and not to 
not to toot my own horn, but the, this was actually that particular year. I was the one that started that and suggested to, to Brett Om to do the same thing. Uh, but what happened was it wasn't just the fact that the Sadducee and Pharisee was falling at the same time and that the church observance of Pentecost was falling at the same time. Like it, it literally, with the exception of the Greek Orthodox, Greek Orthodox was, or, or Eastern Orthodox was still a few weeks later. But the, the, the fact that an overwhelming majority of the body Messiah was uh, observing the events of, of Shavuot and Pentecost on the same day. Anytime unity happens, even when we don't know it, there's power there, right? But the the other thing that made it so interesting that particular year, that made it special that particular year, was that um, uh, uh, the Israeli Independence Day uh, for the beginning of the 70th year of Israel was that uh, that that. I think it was three weeks. I want to say it was three weeks or four weeks before that Shavuot. So the beginning of the 70th year of Israel, uh, the modern state of Israel, uh, was was right there. And then three weeks later, after that, was Yom Yerushalayim, which is the, the, the day of the uni- reunification of Jerusalem. Um, and it was the closing of the 50th year of the reunification of Jerusalem. So you had a three-week period there in which we were in both the 50th year and the 70th year observance of, of major things in Israel – which both were prophetic things, right? The reestablishment of the nation of Israel is an end-time prophetic reality. The reunification of Jerusalem is an end-time prophetic reality. We see that in in, in uh, uh, Luke twenty-one. The you know, Yeshua says, "When the the time the, the time of the Gentiles is draw to a close, when the uh, Jerusalem is reunited under Jewish control and and no longer under the the hands of the nations." Um, and so, there's end time prophetic reality connected to both of those events, and they were celebrations of major uh, cycles. And then, right after Yom Yerushalayim was uh, the the this massive uh, Shavuot Pentecost, where everybody was celebrating at the exact same time. Which was unreal, and and actually, what we ended up doing at CMC was we just did not have a shovel load service at our building at all that year. Um, instead, on that Sunday afternoon, we had uh, rented out the Civic Center. Somebody donated the money for us to rent out the Civic Center in our area, and we partnered with a whole bunch of churches in the area and had this massive joint Pentecost service, shovel load Pentecost service at the Civic Center. I want to say we had six different churches involved directly. And then we had a bunch of other churches represented, plus our congregation was there. Um, and uh, I want to say it was somewhere close to like seven or 800 people, something like that, six, seven, 800 people that were there. Um, in the event, we had a huge joint worship team, and uh, a- and I taught that service and-, and what have you. But, I mean, it was just unreal, powerful move of the Spirit. We had people leaving from the event after it was said and done that were coming up to people from our congregation and saying, I've never experienced the presence of God like this before. And one of our ladies, uh, she was our violinist. She just unfortunately moved uh, away recently and, and we sent her out with a blessing from CMC. But uh, she came up to me. She goes, Rabbi, she goes, I keep having people come up to me and say uh, they'd never experienced the presence of God like this before. And I was like, okay. She goes, I I, I, I just, I don't get it. I was like, you know, what, what do you not get? She goes, well, this is this didn't feel any different than anything we do on a regular basis. How are they living if they're not feeling God like this all the time? This We feel it all the time. And I was like, oh, I didn't think about it like that. But okay, yeah. No, I see that. But yeah, it was this – I mean it was an unreal event. We actually had uh, one of the churches in our area volunteered – their uh or voluntold i guess is a more accurate term i like to use their videographer <laughs> to come and uh and he and i worked together on producing like a promo for the event and oh, we fun. ran it on youtube and social media and put it out everywhere and churches were running it in their services as announcement and stuff i mean it was just an unreal experience um but yeah it's, it's a few years out still uh before that happens again although i don't know that we'll see the same link up with the the uh the way that things fell that year with um the Israeli Independence Day and, sure, and sure. Yom Yerushalayim. Uh, but yeah, it was such a cool thing. And I think anytime we can do something in unity, not just with the Messianic Judaism, but the greater body, uh, you know, obviously there are certain things that are lines drawn on the sand that we can't cross. And we see a lot of that happening. Yeshua warned us that a time would come where, um, you know, even some of the elect would fall away, that there would be false prophets and teachers rising up and so on. We're seeing that all over the place. There's there's no way to deny that. There's no way to close our eyes and pretend it's not happening. But on the areas that are not uh, – or with people where those lines aren't drawn, with people that, you know, sure, we do things a little different. Uh, you know, the, the, the majority of the church doesn't have the same 
reverence and perspective that we have of the Torah and, and so on and so forth. Um, but none of those are salvational issues. And on the things that we can get together on in unity that are salvational issues, that the important matters, but we can major on the majors uh, in unity in the body of Messiah, nothing can stop us. Yeah, and there's some things that we do to influence. Yeah. You know, those people that came to those Shavuot services had never participated in a Shavuot service. They might have participated in a Pentecost service. But they never connected it with the roots of Judaism. They never connected to the olive Mm -hmm. tree in that way. And sometimes just that little seed, that little stirring, can make a difference and change the entirety of how they view something from the Scripture. So I think it's important that we don't uh, uh, give up those opportunities to influence when it's possible. Right. And there's... You know, backgrounds too, of course, will affect how you would celebrate Pentecost. I mean, because I yeah. can tell you, as someone who was, had both been a Baptist and a Lutheran, that the two were very different. Um, you know, Baptists, it might appear in the the announcement slip for that Sunday service that it's a Pentecost that weekend or whatever. But the you know, Lutherans are like, today is Pentecost. Like everyone's wearing everyone's wearing uh, red is the traditional color worn. And is there so, a reason for that? Yeah, the blood. So, yeah. Yes, but it's it all, all, rela- it's, work. It's all related. <laughs> um, and, and if you're at a Pentecostal-type church, Pentecost is like a every huge... Every Sunday. Well... You know, the, I, celebrating the, feast, the day of Pentecost is like uh, almost yeah. their uh, Super Bowl. Yeah. Yeah, it's something I don't... I've noticed in the last probably 10 years i don't see really any churches that are marketing anything about pentecost anymore um i haven't seen any yeah, just your like, high churches yeah yeah like roman catholic eastern orthodox yeah where some lutheran part of the, ca- the 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 calendar for them and such but like you know even pentecostal churches charismatic churches like i haven't really seen anybody do anything other than just a normal Sunday service, we'll just blank There's, COVID. That's yeah, the cop out. Exactly. I mean, there may they they may like throw out a sermon about Acts two, or they may throw out a sermon about sure, uh, you know, the First Corinthians twelve or something like that. But I've I, I legitimately don't think I've seen any church that I kind of keep an eye on in a long time that have done anything intentionally focused on Pentecost, which is crazy, especially because you think about the Pentecostal movement, like it's in your name. Why would you not do something huge and significant? Um, uh, so, it, yeah, it's just weird. It's something that uh, stands out in an interesting way. Well, I think we've covered and answered the question about what our congregations do. If this has been a blessing to you and you've never experienced a Shavuot or Pentecostal service, Pentecost service that you will take time next year to join with a local messianic community and participate in that or even this year many will have their services online if you can't get to one physically right i uh i just looked up the i was trying to clarify what was like the red yeah yeah yeah. (laughs) so it has to do with fire um so tongue tongues of fire orange seems like a better color the spirit uh, the spirit um you know god god is a uh, our god is a that makes a little more sense uh, unquenchable fire so so yeah yeah, so you can check out on the UMJC website, which is umjc.org, if you want to follow along with the special nighttime service or teachings. Uh, so that's available to anybody can can log in and, and be part of that. And, it, and it's free. You just have to do a registration right. so you get the link for right. the, uh, the Or Sunday. you can find a local Messianic synagogue near you and either join with them or watch them online. But but take advantage of the opportunity to uh, to expand your horizons as it deals with uh, the Feast of Shavuot or Pentecost. And we thank you for tuning in, for listening. We hope you join us again. If we have any questions for us that you would uh, just on our social media, just drop the questions in uh, and share these podcasts with your friends. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Messy Antics Podcast. Make sure to subscribe so you can be notified every time we drop a new episode. And be sure to follow and interact with us on social media at Messy Antics Podcast.